Hi, this is Steve Andres. I'm the pastor of New City Church, and this is our podcast. Every week at New City, we invite people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and learn how to make a difference. I want to thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires and challenges you to love God and serve your city more. If you want more info on New City Church or other resources, go to newcity.life today. But for now, enjoy this message. We are so excited that you are with us this morning, and we've been going on this series, this Becoming series. We've been talking about who we're becoming, and not just so much about what we're doing, and not about being human beings, but, uh, excuse me, about being human doings, but being human beings. Who are we becoming? What is God doing in us? I want to read a a passage of scripture to you today that uh, has really has really impacted me. It started with a conversation over breakfast, which I'll share a little bit later. And that conversation led me to this passage. And it's really powerful. It's in Luke. uh, I'm reading from the Gospel of Luke chapter 23. I'm going to read 12 verses to you. What's interesting about what I'm about to read, um, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known as the synoptic Gospels. That means that most of their stories are intertwining and you kind of, you see the, the, the cohesiveness between Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is the only story in Luke that's not in the other Gospels this way, this particular part that I'm going to share with you. So I want you to track with me, okay? Luke 23, it starts off by saying this, then the whole assembly rose and led him, being Jesus, they led him off to Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, we have found this man subverting our nation. He opposes payment to the tax, to taxes, excuse me, of taxes to Caesar and claims to be the Messiah, a king. So Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied, verse 4. Then Pilate announced to the chief priests and the crowd, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But they insisted. He stirs up all the, the people all over Judea and uh, by his teaching. He started in Galilee and has come all the way over here. Then on hearing this, Pilate asked if the man was a Galilean. When he learned that Jesus was under Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who was also in Jerusalem at that time. Verse 8. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had, wanted to, uh, he had been wanting to see him. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform a sign or a miracle. He, he basically had like a, a t-shirt he wanted Jesus to sign. Like, man, you're the guy that's doing all the miracles. This is amazing. Verse 10, the chief priest, excuse me, verse 9. He, he, he plowed, with, plowed him with questions, but Jesus gave him no answers. Verse 10, the chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there, vehemently asking, accusing him. Then Herod and his soldiers ridiculed him and mocked him, dressing him in an elegant robe. And they sent him back to Pilate. Verse 12, this is where we're going to hone in today. I really want you to see this last verse. That day, Herod and Pilate became friends. Before this, they had been enemies. I want to ask a simple question that I'm going to pray And I'm going to give us our topic today. I I want to talk to us for a moment. How do we become more united? Simple question. And I hope that through this text we can extract some things that are going to help us live a more united life. That we can become more united. It's part of our becoming. That God wants us to be closer to those around us. He wants us to be more unified and less divided. Come on, would you pray with me? God, we thank you. For this amazing day, we thank you for blessing us. We thank you for our time and worship, for Pastor Mark's words this morning. Encourage us and bless us today in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, I've been challenged by this series. I don't know about you, but this Becoming series has really done something for me. It's really uh, challenged me. It helps me to look you know, inside and see what God is doing inside of me. And I realize even as I'm focusing on how God is helping me to become all that I can be, I don't know about you, but as a parent, I begin to realize how me and Amy, how Amy and I, how we shape our children as we do certain things for them. That every interaction, that every experience, that every uh, exposure that we give them, every little bit of exposure that we give them is going to shape who they're becoming. As parents, that's kind of a, it's a cool thing to see the parallel between you as a parent with your children and then God as the father towards us. And so I know that uh, Amy and I take it real serious, especially with this task. So we, we monitor everything, right? We, Amy's real good at monitoring what they eat. You know, if it was up to me, uh, I'd be given a lot of sugar. Amy says no. So we go with whatever Amy says. And one of the other things we also monitor is we monitor their television, what they're watching. We want to ensure that what they're watching is good. In fact, 
you know, in some regards, I actually want them to become more like us, Amy and I. So sometimes we show them the classics, right? We show them the classics. If I were to sing the beginning line to you, I'm sure most of you can, can, can finish this off. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. What, 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 what TV show is that from? Oh, come on, guys. You guys can do better than that. What TV show? Mr. Rogers. Okay, so we've been showing the kids Mr. Rogers. The other one we show them is butterfly in the sky. I can go twice as high. Take a look. It's in a book of. Oh, God. Reading Rainbow. Are you guys kidding me? Thank you for those that are watching online. I know you were singing with me in your pajamas with your pancakes. Okay, thank you guys so much. Reading Rainbow. We show the kids all the classics. We try to give them everything we had. In fact, at one point I actually bought a, a VCR because I was like, you know what? I don't want you to have a DVD player. I don't want you to have Blu-ray. I want you to experience what I experienced. I'm going to buy you an Atari, and you're going to level up the way I did throughout my life. We're going to get you a flip phone when you're 19 years old, just like I did. But we, we show them these experiences. We kind of we show them what we grew up on. And in fact, the other day I was scrolling through Netflix, and I saw an old TV show that I grew up watching. Uh, it's called The Wonder Years. Anyone remember The Wonder Years? It's an old show uh, with Kevin and Paul and Arnold and Winnie. We all love that show if you grew up watching it. And I, I turned it on just for a moment. I wanted to have a moment of nostalgia, and I turned it on. And it was interesting. Kevin was having this interaction, and he said these words, and it impacted me. He said, uh, who you are has less to do with who you are and more to do with who you're sitting next to. Think about that. Kevin just dropping Dropping bombs in the Becoming series. Who would have thought? Think about this. Who you are has less to do with who you are and more to do with who you're sitting next to. I think we can all agree that the quality of our life will be determined by the quality of our relationships. I think that's a fair statement. You, you know, the old ad is, right, like, you know, show me your five greatest friends and I'll show you where your five years look. You know, the next five years look. We, we, we know the truth behind this. This is true. Who you sit next to is very important. And so we, we focus really intently to make sure that we're sitting next to people who think like us and speak like us. But I, there's an interesting side to this that I began to think about. What happens if the people that are sitting next to me on my left and my right only think like me and only speak like me and only look like me? And only share the same views I have. What happens then? I truly believe, in fact, the reality is I think my becoming and who I'm developing into is going to be contingent on the people that are around me. But it's, it's super important that they, they don't just look, sound, speak, think like me. I think it's the reason why Jesus, when he was choosing his disciples, would choose fishermen, political zealots, tax collectors, he was able to take an assortment of people and put them together because who you are is less about who you are and more about who you are sitting next to. He understood, Jesus understands the importance of, the, of getting people around you who are different but with the same vision. Different in many different ways but have a same concrete uh, foundation. You know, I was reading an article and it was interesting. It was saying that 80%, they polled uh, over 1,000 people and it was saying that 80% of the people would, uh, they, they said like this, they, they would say that our country is mainly or totally divided. Think about that. We are living in a day and age where division describes us more than unity. We are no longer the United States of America. In a lot of ways, we are actually the divided states of America. On, on history.com, I was reading this, and I thought this was powerful. They said not only because of the political climate, and, but also because of the rise of social media, they believe that we are currently living in a cold civil war. The times we are living in currently are absolutely insane. And there's so many things to look at on, on how we're... Division, is, division of, is a very unique thing. I mean, all of us would almost have the same response. When you speak to someone who hasn't spoken to a family member in decades, we all take the... We're kind of like... We all may have someone that we don't speak to, but division is so unique. Division is one of those things that's hard to wrap your mind around. In fact, division is so interesting... I think about when, when I was a teacher, it was even hard to teach division, the, the four core basic arithmetic uh, principles, right? Ma uh, excuse me, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. The hardest of the four to understand and conceptualize is division. I knew this because I was a teacher, and I remember teaching high school math for many years, uh, special education. And when I taught, it was so challenging for the students to wrap their mind around certain concepts, division being one. The other one that was real interesting to me was fractions. 
Students had a difficult time with fractions. L let me bring you back to school for a second. Let's, let's reel it in. Let me get you back into the classroom and let's explain what a fraction is. A fraction, it's a number on the top, a numerator, right? And then there's a number on the bottom that is a denominator. And in math, when you're adding fractions together, it's important to note this, that you can't add two fractions together unless the denominator is the same. Let me break it to you down another way. Your numerator, the top number, could look very different. So maybe that looks different. Maybe, maybe it's different political views. Maybe, maybe it's because you were born in a different era. Maybe you're, you're a different race or ethnicity. Maybe you, you're from a different part of town. Maybe you're a Cubs fan and maybe someone else is a White Sox fan. Maybe you're a Bears fan, go Bears, and maybe somebody else is a Packers fan. The numerator on the top, what that really represents is the differences we share. But the denominator in, in my life and with a lot of us here, the denominator is simply this, that we have a same foundation. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. So we can come together and look completely different. Wes and I have grown up in different environments. We probably grew up in, in, in complete countercultural experiences. But we can come together and share an experience together because we have the same denominator. Our numerator can look different. Our surface, what the outside looks like, can be different. Our stories can be different. We can cheer for different sports teams. But the reality is we can come together and be unified because we have Jesus as our denominator. And when I think about this, I think about what the psalmist says in Psalm 118, 22, the stone which the, the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. What does that mean? What I, when I think about this verse, I think about how many people today are living at odds with one another because they're true, they've rejected the chief cornerstone, which is Jesus. They're rejecting the common denominator. And, and today, for a few moments, I want to challenge us to stop looking at the numerator, what makes us different. And I want to help us for a moment to begin to look at what makes us the same. When you are standing on a solid foundation like Jesus, friends, we have more in common than we realize. And the enemy would love to do anything. Listen, if the enemy can't convince you to sin, he'll convince you to be separated. He'll convince you to be divided. He'll convince you to separate from one another. Growing up in New York, I knew family members who wouldn't talk to other family members because one was a Yankee fan and one was a Mets fan. That's how deep division is. Let me recap this story to you. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he is praying and he brings his closest friends with him to pray. And when he is praying, he, he, he then gets approached by Judas, one of the former disciples who betrays him and, 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 and he gets arrested. And Jesus gets arrested and we, we see this picture where he's now on trial. And when he's on trial, he, he, he's dealing with the first person. We get two other characters in the story. We get Jesus and then we get Pontius Pilate, who, who at the time presided over Jesus' trial. And Pontius Pilate was the Roman perfect, which was like a governor, okay? He was a governor over Judea. He was a governor in that region. And he begins to talk to Jesus and he's asking questions and Jesus is, is not saying much, but he feels like what the people brought to him wasn't really like an a, a, a easy case. He goes like, I don't really see anything wrong. I'm just going to, I mean, he didn't really do anything. And the people are insistent. No, he, he did this and he did that. And they're, they're really, really pushing for Jesus to die here. And so Pilate, realizing that, that Jesus was a Galilean, he goes, oh, you're from Galilee. Oh, you know what? Let me send you to my friend Herod. And he sends him to Herod, who Herod, if we can, just to simplify, Herod was the, the mayor, if you will, of Galilee. So you get a governor and you get a mayor. You get one who's over an entire region. You get one who's over a specific area. And, and Herod is excited. Herod is like, I've been waiting for this moment. I've seen Jesus traveling. I want his signature. I want to see if he can be a genie in the bottle. Can we do something real cool? And he goes for this approach, and Jesus doesn't really bite. But Herod goes, I don't really see anything wrong. I send him back to Pilate. So he sends him back to Pilate, and Pilate begins to deal with him. And then that verse, verse 12, just hit me last week. It hit me. It literally says that before their interaction with Jesus... They had been enemies. The only difference between them being enemies and them becoming friends was the denominator. It was Jesus. Think about this. They, they had went from being enemies and being separated, but in one moment, them being in the presence of Jesus, 
Pilate on his own, Herod on his own, all of a sudden they became friends. Two people who absolutely opposed each other. Two people who were known as enemies. Two people who did not like each other at all in a moment had the ability to become friends. And it's because the denominator was Jesus. Today I want to give us a couple of principles, just two to be exact, on helping us become more united. I think this is something as believers, you know, we need. The Bible says that they will know, being uh, uh, those that are not believers, will know that we are true believers by our love for one another. So it, it's really hard to love someone that you're divided from. And so today I want to give us a couple of principles that are going to help us to become more united, okay? All those in favor say aye. That was a mumbled aye with the mask on, but I appreciate your part. I, I thank you. Okay, it makes me feel good. If you're at home, make sure you're saying I with us. Let me give you the first point. It's really simple. It's simply this. Spend more time being outward focused. If you want to become more united, you need to spend more time being outward focused. Pastor Steve mentioned that this Friday we had the opportunity to have this past Friday our Fresh Market Friday. And me and Richie got up super early in the morning and we were at a Penske truck uh, dealership and we rented these, these refrigerated trucks. And it was the first time ever that I've driven a truck in my life. It was amazing. I was whipping that thing. I was like, oh. And the steering wheel's down here. So I'm like really like a bus driver. It was amazing. Greatest time of my life. And, you know, it's really hard for me to find differences in other people when I'm serving other people. It's amazing to me. It's amazing how easy I can find something in common with someone when I begin to serve them. And, I, and we, we had this amazing opportunity giving 30,000 pounds of food away. We met people who were just like, this was like their lifeline. They were like, thank you. Thank you so much. I would, me and Richie, were, we were conversing with a guy who, who had a baby pit bull, literally three days old. And he was talking to us. And, and I, literally, if we were to write down our differences, they were probably very long. But because I was serving him, because I wasn't focused on myself, all of a sudden, I was able to find something special in him. Paul says it like this. I love it. In Philippians, that same book that we talked about, Rejoice, where he's in prison. He says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but to the interests of others. I really genuinely believe that when we focus on other people and not just ourselves, we have the ability to become more united. I don't know if you had the opportunity to join us for our, our daily devotions that we've been doing for the 21 day of prayers and prayer and fasting. It's been amazing. I've been encouraged. But I, I've said this about seven times. Jesse's devotional on Tuesday, like, literally impacted me and, like, helped me so much. She said a comment about love is kind. She said, you're able to be more kind when you realize that other people need love the way you need love, that we're all humans and we all need love. Friends, can I encourage us today that it's easy to look at what makes you different, but when you realize that the person sitting across from you needs love the way you need love, they may not see things the way you do, but when you're standing on the solid rock of Jesus, anyone can become united together. Friends, this is huge. You know, uh, David Johnson and I were sitting at Panera Bread. This is where this whole thing came to me. We were sitting at Panera Bread early morning a couple of weeks ago, and we were going through a book together. And as we're sitting there, I mean, I'm in a hoodie. I, I, I looked horrible. I mean, I just, it was super early in the morning, and I just wasn't, I was like disoriented. I don't know what I put on. I looked crazy. And as we're sitting there just going through this book on, on serving others, actually, that's what the book is about. This, this gentleman came up to me who was probably the complete opposite of me. He was, a, he was an older, he was an older white gentleman. He was probably in his 80s. And, and he came to us with tears in his eyes. And I just didn't know what was about to happen. I was like, oh, okay, did I do something wrong? Like, I don't know what's going on. And he's sitting and he pulls his mask down and he goes, I saw you guys reading this book. And the Lord told me to give you some more books. I have books at my home I would love to bless you with. This may seem like a small deal to some of you, but friends, the reality is he was able to bypass the numerator and our surface differences. He was able to bypass all of that to look down and go, these gentlemen are reading the same Bible I'm reading, and I have something that I can bless them with. If we were to live our lives that way, it would change the trajectory of our lives. Let me give you the second point, and it's simply this. In order to, to, to become more united, you have to have a low tolerance for gossip and bullying. This literally seems like my high school teaching days, right? Like have a low tolerance for gossip and bullying. But you'll be surprised how quickly the enemy allows something like gossip and bullying in the church to spread like wildfire. Spread like wildfire. 
you know, I, I think of the, the great evangelist and author who, who preached on prayer and revival. His name was Leonard Ravenhill. He said this quote. He said, notice, we pray for folks. Notice, we never pray for folks we gossip about. And we never gossip about the folk whom we pray. For prayer is a great deterrent. If we were to spend our time not looking at the differences, but taking those, that, that attribute of love is kind, even as Jesse said, and see that everyone needs love the way we need love. And we would begin to pray for them. Pray for them. Jesus wept and prayed over Jerusalem right before they turned their back on him. Think about that. If we, were to, if we were able to take hold of that and begin to pray for those that may be different than us. In fact, you know, 120, over 125 times in the Bible, there's a phrase about the tongue and God's the tongue and the, the power of the tongue. James says to tame the tongue, that it's powerful. It's a powerful muscle. One of the things James says as well in, the, in that book is that fresh water and salt water can't come out from the same spout. I think about this growing up in my home, my mom was very resourceful. So she would, I, I don't know if it's like a Puerto Rican thing. I'm not really sure. But like she would like save oil, right? Like she would cook with oil, save it, and reuse it in some other capacity. Okay, she was very frugal with that, I guess. And I remember one day I came home thirsty. Like I was like parched. I had just been playing basketball. And she had cooked. And I smelled the food from the hallway. I'm like, oh, this smells great. Oh, arroz con candule, we're about to get it in. This is great, some platanos, let's go. And I smelled it, and she was in the shower, and she was doing her thing. And I walked in, and I, I come in, and I'm like, oh, I'm thirsty. And I grab, like, this apple juice bottle. And I'm like, oh, man, I don't remember us. I thought we finished the apple juice. But all right, and I unscrew it, and I just begin to drink oil that had just come out of a pan. And it was interesting to me because as silly as that that experience was for me, the truth of the matter is as believers, as believers, in light of all that Christ has done for us, some of us look like we are holding the living water. Some of us are looking like we have the ability to give someone something that can quench their thirst. But because we're allowing salt water and fresh water to come out of the same spout, someone goes to take a drink of what we've been telling them about on Sundays, and then they hear something about what we think about what's going on in our world today, and it's like drinking oil out of an apple juice bottle. Friends, can I tell you today, the, 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 the book of Ephesians says it like this, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building, building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. I believe with all of, our, with all of my heart today that if we took more time and focused more on loving others and building others up, we would find that we have so much more in common. So much more. I realized this when we moved to Lafayette, Louisiana. I, there was probably 1% Puerto Ricans in Lafayette. And it was me, my three children, and my wife. That, like, we made up the 1%. It was all of us combined. And one other guy named Gio. There was like five, there was six of us. And I remember going there and, 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 and having this sense of, like, you hear about the South. When you're from the North, you hear about the South and, and how racial tension is thick and and you just, you just get worried. And I remember before moving to Lafayette, just being so, so, so worried. And the third day I was there, uh, we had, this is our first home. We purchased our first home and I was in the garage. You know, I'm hype, I'm setting things up. I'm like, let's go. And I was on a stepladder with some slippers. And like, you know, I just never had a stepladder before. And I've only had slippers. I wanted to see how they work together. And I ended up spraining my ankle really bad. Like I fell off, I was like, ah! And I drove myself to the hospital and I got to the hospital. And, and there was this moment where this woman who looked completely different than me, she came to me after our five or six interactions with tears in her eyes, and she just goes, I saw on your form that you wrote you're a pastor. What church do you go to? And I was like, oh, man, I go to the church down the block. And she began to cry going, I, I, I've not experienced someone as nice as you. And I don't say that to give me any glory. What I say to that is when we are truly allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us, people will begin to see what we have in common more than what we have different. I attended a funeral not too long ago, and these words were on the screen, and it really impacted me. I want to show you this quote. It was a woman who was dying of cancer, and she said this, it doesn't scare me that the, this diagnosis could take, a, take me away any day. What scares me is being healed and having all this life transformation, 
emotional healing, freedom, and trust in God fade away. You could really tell a lot. You could learn a lot from someone who's on their deathbed. Who, who They know they have nothing to lose. They, they, they begin to speak truths. And this is powerful, powerful to me when I think about this, that God is transforming us and, and he's doing something in us. And to lose all of this in a moment is, is scary. Like, it's powerful to me. I think about a time when Jesus was knowing that he was about to approach the cross. And we have the opportunity to have like, a nest camera in the prayer closet of Jesus. Jesus is praying. We had the opportunity to have someone record it for us. And in John 17, we get these amazing words. John 17, these are lifelong prayers of mine. He says this in John 17. My prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about the disciples here. I pray also for those who will believe in me because of their message. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you and I are one. Think about this. There is no closer unity than the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is no way you could get closer. And Jesus, in his final moments, when he knows he's about to, to face the cross, when he knows he's about to approach death, he prays for unity. He says, Father, just as you and are in me and I am in you, may, the, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. What good is it if we tell people that there's a Jesus who can change everything? What good is it if we tell people about this Jesus who's done so much for us if we're not living in unity with one another? Friends, listen to this quote from Charles Spurgeon. He says, Satan always hates Christian fellowship. It is his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything which can divide saints from one another, he delights in. He attaches far more importance to godly intercourse than we do since union is strength. He does his best to promote separation. Is it possible today that we've been looking at the numerator of those around us and finding differences that may be true? Listen, they, there may be a lot of differences. But as believers, it is my mandate not to look at the differences of someone, but to find a common thread between me and them. Because that's what Jesus did on the cross. You see, when Jesus was on the cross, it was the ultimate form of unity. He, didn't, he not only brought Herod and Pilate together, he brought me and God together. See, when he was dying on the cross, we were separate. There was like an island. Let's say I'm an island over here and God is an island and what separates us is sin. And when Jesus went on the cross and took the death that I deserve and hung there, he created a bridge, a bridge so that I can have access to God and he can have access to me. Now we have access to one another for true fellowship. And God doesn't look at me by my sins because that would separate us. That's my numerator. What God views me as is righteous because of the righteousness of his son who died on the cross for me, friends. Today, I believe with all my heart, God wants us to focus less on how we are different and more on how we're the same. And so I'm going to get ready to pray in just a moment here. But I want to ask you to be a little introspective, a little different than we've done before. The band is going to play. The team is going to play. I'm going to ask you in this moment, whether you're watching online or whether you're right here in person, no matter where you are, I want you to close your eyes for a second. I want you to close your eyes. And before I pray for you, I want you to think about someone maybe who you've been separated from, someone who you've been focused more on the differences than the commonalities. I want you to be introspective in this moment and ask God to search your heart. That's what the psalmist says, search me, O Lord. Search me, O Lord. Right now, I don't care if you're a staff member, I don't care if you're a high level leader, I don't, position doesn't matter to God. Posture matters to God. Check your heart right now. Think, is there anyone who I've allowed the differences of this world to separate me instead of looking at Christ, the solid rock on which I stand? And in a moment, our team is going to sing those words again. Amen. You know what that, that phrase means? Amen is a word that means so be it. And so I'm going to pray here that God will help us to be more united. And we're going to conclude that by saying amen. And that what we're going to do in this moment is say, God, so be it. Help me to love like you love. Help me to not look at the differences, but to look at the commonalities. God, we thank you for your loving kindness, which is better than life itself. And now, God, we pray that you would help us to be more focused on what we have in common, which is you, God, Christ, the solid rock on which I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. God, help us today to focus on all that you've done for us, Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.